too, right? Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Federal Funding 101. We're going to get started in about two minutes just to let our other friends have a few minutes to log on. And uh, thank you so much for being here today. So we'll start in about two more minutes. Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started in about a minute, but while we do, um, we'll wait for our, some more friends to pop on here. I just wanted to say good, good morning. It's actually good afternoon now, isn't it? Noon here. Um, welcome to USF Connect. I'm Shannon Pastizo, Program Director here for USF Connect. We're super excited today to have one of our colleagues and someone we work with a lot um, is Elizabeth Nelson. She's the Program Director at the Florida High Tech Corridor, and she represents the University of South Florida. Today, she's gonna to present for us a high-level overview, Federal Funding 101, on the Small Business Innovation Research and Small Business Technology Transfer Program. We also like to call it, because we love our acronyms here mm -hmm. and everywhere else, SBIR and STTR program. These programs are gonna provide non-dilutive funding for small businesses to bring new innovations to market. They often provide that early investment for the high-tech startups that can be leveraged to, and to build research collaborations with university faculty. So Elizabeth's going to give us this information today. She's well-versed in this program. She and I have been uh, lucky enough to be on committees for that throughout the state of Florida. Um, she has served in the past in other uh, venues here with the Chief of Staff for the New York State Council of Arts. And she has been went to SUNY, which is State University of New York at Plattsburgh. So I had to throw that in there because I had to giggle. Um, in her bio when it said SUNY, you know, it said State University. I know it is SUNY because she's from New York. I'm yeah. from Connecticut. So fast friends we are. Um, so here we are. Miss Elizabeth, we're going to let you take it away. For everyone here, just some quick housekeeping. We are recording. So you will get a copy of this recording when we're done. It will be part of your survey that gets sent out. As well as um, if you have any questions, you're welcome to put them in the Q&A or the chat. We'll be answering those at near the end of the program. Liz will present her, her uh, presentation for us and then we'll be happy to take questions. And we thank you to everyone who gave us some questions along the way as well. So we could weave those into the presentation. So without further ado, I'll stay out of the way. Uh, Elizabeth, you get to take it away. Talk to everybody. We're super excited for this. Can't wait to hear tapping into the SBIR STTR program to bring the technology to market. All right, thanks very much. Thanks for the intro, Shannon. Thank you everyone for, for joining. Um, we're gonna just dive right in here. So as Shannon mentioned, I am going to give a real high level overview of the SBIR STTR program um, known collectively as America's Seed Fund. So I hope at the end of this presentation, you have a good sense of the, the, the basics of the program and whether or not this could potentially be a good fit for your business. Um, when we wrap up, we'll, we'll leave you with some resources to really dig in deeper. Um, as you can imagine, it's a federal funding, so it's pretty complex. Um, there's a bit of a learning curve, but hopefully after today, you'll have a, um, a pretty good you know, 101 um, overview of the program. So we're going to walk through the eligibility, some of the, the goals of the program, the general structure, um, some tips on how to get started and put together 
an application. And then we're also going to talk a little bit about using this program to build relationships with the university um, and the Florida High Tech Corridor, which is the, um, the program that I oversee here um, at USF. So let's jump in. So what is America's Seed Fund, SBIR, STTR? So this is a federal funding program. It's overseen by the Small Business um, Administration, but it's, it's administered by individual federal agencies. And in total, this is up to $3.7 billion in non-dilutive funding that can go directly to small businesses to help them bring their technology to market. So there's they make up to 5,000 new awards um, each year. And as you can imagine, it's, it's a relatively competitive program given that you know non-dilutive funding, but it's really here for kind of early stage technologies that um, you know, perhaps aren't quite ready for, for larger investment or need some more technical um, research done to get them to the next step. So what are the, the goals of this program? At the end of the day, one word, it's commercialization. That is the primary goal of this program, to leverage federal funding to bring technologies to market. So this isn't providing funding for, for basic research. Um, it's not supporting kind of tech for tech's sake. It's really to help take early stage technologies that have a major commercial you know, application or commercial potential and help bring them that much closer to market. So I put up here these bullets. These are kind of the, the formal goals that the, the SBA posts on their website. And you can see that thread running through there, you know, commercialization, innovation, helping small businesses taking their, their tech to market. I want to especially point out the, the last bullet because with my university hat on, that fostering technology transfer, that is where kind of the universities are especially interested in this program. It's, it's a really good opportunity for our faculty members to work with startups or perhaps even launch their own startup um, and bring technology that they're developing in the lab and take it to, to the marketplace. So we'll dig into that a little bit more later. So now who is eligible for this program? So we kind of break eligibility down in, into two different buckets. We have kind of what types of organizations are eligible and then who's eligible to lead a project. So this is funding for US small businesses. So when we mean when we say US, we mean that the ownership is primarily majority owned by uh, a US citizen or a permanent resident. Pretty straightforward, cut and dry. But when we say small business, that is the federal definition of small business. So they consider a small business anything south of 500 employees. So obviously, you know, working with the Tampa Bay Technology Incubator and some of the other incubators around town, they have, you know, a bit of a different definition of, of perhaps small business. So this isn't just, you know, for the, you know, two, three, four, 10 employee companies. You can leverage this opportunity as you grow into a second stage company, when you have hundreds of employees, as long as you're south of, of 500 employees, you are considered by the federal government a small business. So then when we're talking about who can lead these projects. Um, so kind of in, in this program and in the academic sense, we call that person the principal investigator or to throw another acronym at you, the PI. And what they're looking for in the, in the project lead is someone who has kind of a well-rounded expertise to oversee the project. So they're gonna need to have both kind of the scientific and technical expertise to run the program, but also the, the managerial expertise to you know, administer a federal, you know, a federal award and you know, kind of run the operations of, of the project. So, when, when we're talking about you know, scientific and technical background, that doesn't necessarily mean you do not have to have a PhD, you don't have to have um, an MD, but you have to be a subject matter expert, you know, enough to be able to oversee the project. And you know, so this is for the project lead. This isn't to say that um, you know, it's, it's solely on the project lead to be the end all be all in all aspects. They're gonna look very much at what 
kind of team have you assembled? Do you have um, the, the kind of resources and capabilities across your team in order to deliver um, on, the, on the proposed research? So this program is broken down into three phases. Um, the third phase is, is commercialization. That's when you are taking this to market. So if you were working with the Department of Defense, this is when you would get your first DOD contract to become a vendor. Um, outside of that, there isn't you know, typical SBIR funding for phase three. So while it's, you know, they consider it a three-phase program, when you're looking for opportunities to apply for, you're gonna see phase one or phase two. So it's gonna start off phase two. This is kind of, if, if the whole program is a seed program, phase one is the seed of the seed. So this is very early stage. You're still kind of testing your science, testing your technology, um, seeing if there's some, some feasibility, maybe doing some early um, proof of concepts. So it's a relatively short term, up to a year, and a relatively um, small amount of money, maxing out normally around $250,000. So even at this early stage, when you're still you know, kind of testing the, the feasibility, you don't want to forget about that overarching goal of the program, commercialization. So is there a commercial market for this? Is this solving a real need or challenge? Um, making the case that this isn't just, you know, tech for tech's sake or, or an interesting solution, that it is in fact responsive to a real, um, a real problem or, or unmet need. And on the flip side of, of the phase one, it also gives the individual funders, the individual agencies, a chance to get to know you a little bit better, to, to test your performance, see if you're able to deliver um, on on your proposed research before um, kind of opening the door to the bigger dollars in, in phase two. So phase two, that's where some of the money really starts to be um, impactful. And you're gonna basically, it is a waterfall program. So in most cases, you're gonna start with phase one, that's gonna unlock the opportunity for you to apply for a phase one, phase two, excuse me, which can go all the way up to one and a half million dollars. And that's where you'll start to, you'll build on the work in phase one, build a larger um, prototype, make a demo of your, of your technology, basically start to build out your team, get, take it you know, that much closer to, to commercialization. So we had a, a company that spun out of one of our faculty labs or a former member of the Tampa Bay Technology Incubator. They received 100K in phase one, where they did a um, kind of refine some of their technology, they created a bench size prototype. Then they went on to phase two where they got um, just shy of a million dollars and were able to create a full size demo that they could kind of take on the road and use to, to bring customers on. So that's kind of the, how it flows. You know, you start with a little bit of money, build your case, then go into phase two, really you know, blow it out, take it to the next level. And then phase three, commercialization, you're in the marketplace. Right. So up until this point, I've, I've been using SBIR and STTR a little bit interchangeably. And that's because for all intents and purposes, they have much more in common than they have different, but they are two separate programs. So I just want to kind of spell out what the differences, it, differences are. Um, and they primarily come down to um, the program's approach to partnering. So in an SBIR, you are allowed to partner with um, a university, a research institute, a subcontractor, outside vendors. Um, there's a limit on how much of the work can be outsourced, but it is allowed. Um, in an STTR, you are required to partner with a university or a research institution. So if you remember that TT and STTR stands for technology transfer. So this program is really designed to incentivize companies and universities to work together to take technology out of the lab and into the marketplace. So the SBIR program is significantly larger. We'll see that on the next slide when we have a breakdown of um, kind of the numbers in which agencies participate. But from the university perspective, we work a lot with STTRs given the fact that um, you know, the university is, is a requirement. So when we have faculty members that are 
um, creating startup companies, they tend to, to kind of first dip into the STTR um, pool since it's you know, perfectly designed for that type of work. One kind of clarification point, one thing that is consistent between SBIR and STTR, the small business is always going to be the applicant. You are always taking the lead, compiling the application, submitting the application. And then if you're funded, you're the one that receives the funds, manages the award, and you would put a subcontract in place if you were working with the university or another vendor to take a portion of those, that prime award and subcontract it out to, to your partners. Okay, so this is what I mentioned um, earlier when I said the Small Business Administration is the umbrella. They're the ones that are um, kind of administrating the program, doing the marketing, um, but the individual federal agencies are the ones that allocate their funding to it and therefore determine um, what their priorities are, what they're looking to fund. They're the ones reviewing the application making the award, doing the contracting, everything like that. So the way that that's determined, it's um, based on the size of the agency's research budget. So any federal agency that allocates more than $100 million towards research is required to participate in the SBIR. So they have to carve out a piece of that research budget and earmark it specifically for small businesses through the SBIR program. Those agencies that are significantly larger um, are also required to do something similar for the STTR program. So you'll see those top five um, agencies there in green. Those are the, the large agencies that because of their budget participate in both the SBIR and the STTR program. So you'll see DOD, not too surprising, they have the biggest budget. They are the largest participant in, in this program. But I don't want you to discount DOD if you don't consider yourself you know, a traditional defense company. You might be surprised. They are, the Department of Defense has really a vast and varied interest uh, when it comes to technology. They're interested a lot in what they call dual use technologies. So those are technologies, innovations that have a military application, but also have a civilian application. Um, you know, they have a huge interest in life sciences and health, given, you know, the number of people that they employ and deploy, you know, around the world. Um, I'm going to steal my colleague Jack, his favorite example. Um, they previously had a call for companies that were developing probiotic supplements for dolphins. So you wouldn't immediately think, why is the Department of Defense, you know, concerned about dolphins gut health? not where I necessarily would have gone to search for funding if I'm in, in that space, but turns out that the dolphins actually help mark underwater mines and support some other um, naval activities. So that was something that they were interested in funding. So when we get on to actually looking into opportunities, um, I'll point out ways that you can kind of search broadly so that you don't miss some of those um, funding opportunities that might actually be applicable to your technology, but wouldn't you know, necessarily jump out as a place to look. All right, so if so far, if you're with me so far, and this seems like it could be um, a good fit, something you wanna look into, the very first thing I would recommend you do is, is get started with the formal registration you're gonna need to go through. The registration process, it's, this is federal funding, there are some hoops, there's some bureaucracy, this can take you know, six to eight weeks, potentially longer. So get started now so that if you find an opportunity that you're ready to apply for, you're not kind of backpedaling and potentially locked out because you haven't done some of, some of the basics. So there are two registrations that are required for any company that's applying to any SBIR. So that would be your, your place to start, what you want to check off the list. So the first is through the System for Awards Management, or SAM. So that portal is where the federal government manages their awards and how they provide funding. Um, so once you register through that, you're going to receive this unique entity identity number. 
Um, this is actually replacing the DUNS number. So prior to April of 2022, there were actually three registrations you had to go um, go through. You had to get your DUNS number, then you could do SAM. Um, they've, they've refined that a bit. So now you don't need the DUNS number. You can go right to SAM. You get this UEI number. With that, then you can register with the Small Business Administration in their, um, on their sbir.gov website, which is gonna basically unlock your access to the SBIR um, program. So those two registrations are required of everyone. So again, if you're generally interested, I would say get started on those. Can't hurt, um, it'll take a little time, but at least it's, it's one less thing to do down the road. Um, and then of course, there's additional registrations based on the, the agencies, they have to get into the game too. So. Um, if you really start to narrow in on a particular agency, it might be smart to, to begin those registrations as well. Um, you'll see those kind of broken down um, on the screen, but at the, at the very least, I would recommend you get started on, on the first two registrations. You can cross those off your list. All right, so now we're gonna hop into a, a bit more uh, kind of a more fun way to, to prepare, actually digging in and learning about what opportunities are um, available and understanding what agencies are interested in and what types of technology. So the SBIR.gov, um, that's the, the main website that's run by the SBA. It actually has a really good portal for doing this type of research. So it pulls together all of the opportunities and awards and information from all of the 15 plus agencies that participate. So you can search in one place. You don't need to run to, you know, 15 different government websites to see what individual agencies are, are interested in funding. So there are um, two different ways primarily to, to search um, for opportunities. So you can do a topic search and that's, you can search for the open topics. And so these are, when I say topics, these are the, the calls, the requests for proposals, the, the opportunities that are um, you know, accepting applications. So they break it down. You can search for open topics. So these are things that you can apply for immediately. So you know, that's, I'm sure, where you're gonna wanna start just to see what's, what's available now, what, what is open, what can I apply for? Um, you can search by, by keywords based on your technology. You can um, filter by, by different agencies. Um, so you can really kind of dig in and play with it. I'd recommend, you know, make, make a list of five or 10 keywords um, that you're interested in, and then, you know, just kind of dig in, spend some time really searching through that, that portal to see what's open. Um, if you see something that's interested, it's gonna have a link that'll take you to kind of a summary page, and then it will redirect you to the agency where that will walk you through, you know, the nitty gritty of all the, all the details. You can also search for closed topics. So this might seem a little counterintuitive because these aren't topics that you can actively apply for, um, but it's a good way to see, you know, what has come out in the past. A lot of these um, calls are kind of cyclical. So if you find an opportunity that seems relevant, you'll, you'll be able to tell, oh, you know, this just closed two weeks ago, but it, was, it seems like it's quarterly. Let me kind of bookmark that and keep it in mind. So the other way to, to kind of do some, some intelligence and a little bit of research is through the awards information. So successful applications, their abstracts and the basic details of their project are all public information and are posted on, on this site. So you can use the awards information, again, with those keywords to search and get a better understanding of which agencies are funding what type of, of research. You can you know, filter by year, filter by the agency, filter by phase see what's been successful, but also in reading the abstracts, see how they've kind of positioned it. What has their um, approach been? And you can also search by company. So if you have peers or you have aspirant peers and you wanna do a little you know, competitive um, research, search them, see if they've participated in this program, if they've been successful, what agencies they've gone to, um, you know, the, the types of, of dollar amounts that they've received just to get a better sense of um, you know, which agencies you should start really kind of honing in on and focusing on more closely.
Another, you know, relatively easy, quote unquote, way to, to dip your toe into the, the SBIR um, waters is through the National Science Foundation or NSF. So, you know, they're the National Science Foundation. So they have a very broad, um, you know, areas of interest. So up on the screen, that's there, there are 30 key areas of interest, um, and one of them is other. So as you can imagine, you can probably make the case that any of your technologies would fit into an area that they are interested in. And what they do that's unique, they allow you to submit a relatively short um, pitch, so about 1,500 words, comes down to about four or five pages, um, where you basically, you describe your innovation, you know, what your research or technical objectives are, to that commercialization piece, you talk about your market, and then you outline who the team is. Um, the NSF will review all of those. The individual program directors will review those and then get back to you within a month to say, this is generally a fit. We'd like you to submit a full proposal or on the other, you know, on the flip side, this isn't, you know, quite a fit. This isn't responsive to what we're looking for. Um, if you are invited to pitch, you then have a year to kind of get all your ducks in a row, get find the right opportunity and submit um, an SBIR or an STTR. So the NSF program is still highly competitive. You know, if you are invited to, to submit a full proposal, it's by no means a guarantee that you're gonna receive funding, but at least it gives you a little bit of feedback before you, you know, go ahead and invest all the time and effort um, into submitting a, a full proposal. All right, so this is this is the fun slide. I try and bury this, you know, deep in the presentation so that I don't lose people um, too quickly at the at the onset here. Um, you know, like I mentioned on the NSF slide, this is a very competitive program. It is, you know, non dilutive funding that's open to to small businesses across the country. So there are a lot, you know, a lot of applications. Looking at, at phase one, that's basically an open call. Um, and there's you know, less than a 20% chance of, of receiving funding. But the good thing is if you then look at phase two, so those that have successfully cracked into phase one, you now have a better than 50% chance of receiving a phase two, which like we saw earlier, that's where some of the really big money can come in. So you know, we've, we've heard from entrepreneurs. We had a, a panel that we arranged at Synapse and they talked about this a little bit. You know, it's important to, to start early, stick with it, try not to get discouraged. You know, you're likely not going to you know, get funding your first or second attempt, but once you're able to crack into this, it can really open some significant opportunities for you. So understanding how competitive this program is, how do you go ahead and compile a successful grant application? So I break it down into two components. You have kind of the administrative piece and then you have the, the case building or the, uh, the content side of things. So to get started on the, the administrative side. So one of the, the first things you can do even before you are you know, fully ready to submit is start to connect with the agencies that you're interested in applying for. Connect with the relevant um, program managers for each. So at each agency, there are program managers that run the individual programs over, you know, individual focus areas. Um, their contact information is included on the solicitations. They often do um, kind of agency specific webinars, ask me anything style um, events that give you a chance to meet the, the program directors. But connect with them, have a chance to hear directly from them. What are they looking to fund? What are, um, you know, what from their perspective makes a strong um, application and, and reach out to them. They are here to, to meet with potential applicants. So ask for a few minutes of their time um, and then be prepared to just listen to what they have to say. So the next step, staying organized is a huge piece component for success. These are extremely complex solicitations. If you, when you find one and you open it up, there are you know, detailed requirements about what type of information, what the format of that information needs to be, what support materials, how to put together a budget. It can definitely be overwhelming if you know, for the first time that you, you take a look at one of these. So 
read the solicitation, of course, very closely, um, but then start to make you know, a checklist for yourself of these are all the documents that I'm going to need. These are kind of the, the day by day, week by week milestones I need to hit to get this completed. And also build yourself kind of proposal templates. So, um, you know, building out these are the different sections I have to address. So when you have that information, you can easily plug it into this template and it's all um, in one place. And then last but not least, submit early. Give yourself, if you can give yourself a week, great. Give yourself at least two days um, to submit these, these applications. So if the application is due on the 10th, you know, trick yourself and put it in your calendar that it's due on the 7th or the 8th. Um, submitting, it can take all day. These are very complex. There's a lot of um, you know, detailed information and different documents that you're gonna need. Um, so kind of set yourself up for success and give yourself a little bit of breathing room. And even if you are fully prepared and have everything you need, you know, we're talking about government websites here. So you don't want to give yourself an hour to submit. And then, you know, you and 99% of the pool are all submitting at once. And there's some type of, you know, technical, technical glitch. So give yourself some breathing room to get these in. You know, if, if you go through the process of, compiling the full application and then you're not able to submit on kind of a technicality or a technical glitch, it's going to be, you know, pretty, pretty heartbreaking. All right. So now moving on to the actual content um, of the application. So like I mentioned before, the solicitation is going to spell out in detail what they're looking for and um, how they are reviewing these applications. So make sure you're explicitly responsive to what they're what they're looking for. Um, some general advice that's going to apply to um, all the agencies, any of the solicitations. So first, focus on what's innovative about your technology. How is it new and unique? How is it different from the the current state of the art? So differentiate yourself for from what's already out there. Make sure that that is you know, very explicit. They don't have to kind of um, have a lot of background on the particular market to understand why your technology is different and what's the value that your technology adds. And then talking about the, the experience and the qualifications and the facilities that you have, have access to. So being able to deliver on the proposed research is, is obviously a big component of what they're looking for. So they're going to want to get a sense that you have built a team of people that have the expertise necessary to deliver on the research that's being funded. So again, be very explicit with who's on your team, here are their qualifications, here are the individual roles that they are going to play. And here are some, you know, if you need particular equipment, or facilities that you have access to those. And this is where universities can come in to help strengthen some of that. So if there is a kind of a gap in your team or perhaps some really specialized expensive equipment that you need access to, this is where the university can come in and be a partner and kind of round out um, the expertise that the, the business itself might not have in, um, you know, in-house. And then finally, again, last but not least, like I mentioned, you know, a few times throughout this commercialization, even in your phase one application, when it's very, very early stage, you need to hammer home on, on what the commercialization plan is for this technology. So what's the market? How have you determined that there is a market? Um, you know, are you able to justify a demand for this solution as opposed to just, this is a really great solution we would think that people will need it. You know, this is a great solution. And here's how we demonstrate that people are willing to pay for this solution. Um, and then what's your plan to, to take it to market? So again, even in phase one, you know, what is your commercialization plan? Assuming that you're, you're gonna be funded in phase one, you're gonna go to phase two. Now you're into that, that phase three and commercialization. Um, what is, is your plan there? So before I segue kind of into the university um, partnership piece, I just wanted to pause and take, um, take a quick look at the Q&A and see if there's any um, specific questions I can address before we um, move on to the, the university partnering piece. So 
So one oh, question. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Just I wanted to have you just someone wanted to know your social media contacts. Those will be included with this survey at the end. So there you go. Just wanted that one to help you with that one. Go ahead. Perfect. All right. So the one question that's jumping out to so the timeline. So that's a, a really, really good question. So um, typically they will, the, the application, you know, the, the opportunity will be open from, you know, anywhere from four to eight weeks. So it's a relatively short turnaround from when they begin accepting applications to when, um, you know, applications are due. So that's why it's really important to do some um, initial research so you're not caught flat-footed if when an opportunity arises. And also why it's really important to stay as organized as, as possible because you don't have a lot of time to pull together all of, all of the resources. So the question from Logan, could you find, um, is there a way to find out if your idea is a good fit um, before putting in the time to register? So you can kind of do the research and start to reach out to, to individual program managers. Um, you can attend their agency specific events without registering. There's a lot of kind of backend research that you can do um, before you even start the registration process. That, that NSF pitch does require um, some registrations and the, the NSF specific registration um, as well. All right, so I'll hold a couple of these till the end um, and we will we'll continue on. All right, so why is someone from USF, what, why are we here talking to you about um, the SBIR STTR program? So the way that I personally have kind of learned about the program is through um, companies that are partnering with our faculty members on this opportunity and are then coming into the university to do um, research. And so the SBIRSTTR um, can be a really great way to build relationships with faculty here at USF and at other, other universities. So from the company's perspective, you know, like I mentioned before, if, if you're looking to kind of round out your team, if there is um, expertise that you don't have in-house, or if you just think it would be valuable to have some outside um, you know, perspective and expertise, that is where um, university faculty can fit in really nicely into these, into these programs. Um, and from the faculty perspective, these are, they're kind of like a safe space um, for them to, to start working with, with smaller businesses. Um, from my personal experience, you know, our faculty, they're aware of, of the SBIR, STTR program, how it works. They're certainly aware of how federal funding works. So it, you know, when I reach out and say, hey, we have a company that might be, that's interested in doing an SBIR, it's clear that, um, you know, there's some funding on the table. Obviously, there's a level of sophistication within the company that they are um, able to pursue these types um, of opportunities. So when you're kind of doing a, a cold outreach to um, a faculty member, if you don't have established relationships, starting with an SBIR um, or STTR pro project is a really good way to go about it. Um, we had a, a company just a couple of years ago, actually from the University of Central Florida incubator over in Orlando that reached out to me. Um, they're in the autonomous vehicle space and they knew that USF had some expertise in that area. So we were able to help kind of play matchmaker to um, a faculty member in our uh, Center for Urban Transportation Research. They went ahead and submitted an SBIR together. Um, and then from there, they used that to build a really strong relationship and go after a number of other um, federal funding opportunities and were able to land you know, $3.5 million Department of Transportation grant. And that started from you know, a relatively small um, SBIR project that they did together. So the other, you know, cherry on top for working with with university faculty is the Florida High Tech Corridor Matching Grants Program. So this is um, the program that I oversee here at at USF. So I'm going to talk a little bit um, about that, and we'll we'll wrap up from there. So the Florida High Tech Corridor is an economic development initiative that was founded by the University of South Florida, the University of Central Florida, and the University of Florida. Um, and the, 
primary goal is to grow and support high-tech businesses here in the Central Florida region, um, as well as, as the workforce, you know, AKA our students um, to support those, those companies. So just over the, the past year, the corridor has really taken an active role in helping um, Florida small businesses tap into the SBIR STTR. Um, and that's thanks in no small part to, to two of my colleagues, Jack and Amy, that have really led that effort. Um, they were awarded the SBIR Catalyst Prize, which um, allowed them to provide some one-on-one -on -one funding to women-owned businesses um, that are really underrepresented within the SBIR um, awardees. And they're currently pursuing some other opportunities to offer SBIR support more broadly um, across the state. So hope to be, be back to, to this group with some good news on, on that front as well. But let me give you a little more detail about the matching grants research program. So this is a really, really good companion to the SBIR STTR. So big picture, if uh, your company is partnering with a USF or a UCF faculty member on an SBIR STTR, the Florida High Tech Corridor can invest matching funds into the research being done here at the university um, to basically expand what is able to be covered by that subcontract. And, and this can really be especially meaningful for phase ones because you know, if, if the total award is only $100,000, your subcontract is 30, you know, that can only go so far. So if you're getting some additional state funds invested into, into it through the, the corridor, that can be really impactful. Um, so just to, to be extremely clear, these funds are going to the research being completed at the university. They're not going to the company, but there's a direct benefit, of course, back to the company because you're able to complete that much more research um, with, our, with our faculty members. So if it seems like you need um, you know, some outside expertise, this is a definitely, I hope, to be kind of a, an incentive to, to reach out and to work with, with one of our faculty members. Um, we are here to help play matchmaker. So there is a tremendous amount of research going on um, at USF, at UCF as well. Um, we by no means expect that, that local companies are going to know who's doing what, who would be a good partner, who to reach out for. So that's what we are here for. Um, I regularly meet with companies, learn a little bit about what their, um, you know, what their needs are, what kind of research aims they're looking to achieve. And then I turn around to the different colleges and say, hey, we have a company that's looking for expertise in X, Y, and Z. You know, who can we who can we match them up this? Would this be of interest to you know Professor So and So? From there, we'd set up a kind of like a first date between the company and the faculty member to really talk through the specifics of you know what are the what's the company's needs, and if that aligns well with what the faculty member is you know what their interests are, what their research objectives are, um, then we can help guide you through the process of of doing a a collaborative um, research project together. And like I said, the SBIR STTR is, is a really great way to, to start that conversation. I've, I've noticed just over the past year that when I reach out to faculty and say, hey, this is, this is the opportunity they're going after, this is the SBIR they're going after, faculty seem to be much more responsive because it's, it's a bit more of a known entity than perhaps just a um, you know, kind of a broad, oh, they're interested in collaborating. There's kind of some parameters and structure around it. So if at any point you come across a, an opportunity and you're, you're interested in working with faculty, I, I encourage you to reach out to me. This is what I'm here for to, to play matchmaker. Um, so please, please do. And I know they're gonna share um, contact info um, at the end. I'm happy to have initial conversations with anyone that's interested. So with that, that kind of wraps up the, the formal part of um, the presentation. You know, high level America's Seed Fund, there's up to $3.7 billion in non-dilutive funding that's available for small businesses. So I hope after sitting in today, you have kind of a good sense of um, if you're interested in pursuing it and some, some ways to, to learn a little bit more. Um, I have some resources up here, which uh, I'll also have the team send around. Um, my colleagues at the corridor created this great um, checklist to help you further kind of decide if this is a good fit for you. 
um, the SBIR website um, is really, really well done, and they're actually updating it um, over the summer. So I think it's, I had a chance to see a beta. I think it's going to be a really um, kind of customer service focused, um, welcoming website. Um, they have some information on webinars. So when I mentioned kind of the agency specific events, um, that's where you can go for more info on that. Super detailed tutorials and videos. Um, this coming week is actually um, America Seed Fund Week. So this is a, a program powered by the, um, the Small Business Administration where they pull together a bunch of different events and activities and awards all around SBIRs. Um, so good timing. They have a number of events on their website if you want to dig in a little bit deeper. And then, of course, the website for the Florida High Tech Corridor and specifically the, the matching grants program here at USF that lays out that in much more detail with all the guidelines and, and good stuff like that. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and take it um, directly to, to Q&A. All right, Elizabeth, you want to look at some of them or you want me to just shoot them off? Sure. Yeah, let me, prefer. let me, I'll kind of scroll through here and then feel free to help me if I'm, if sure. I look like I'm struggling. Um, <laughs> so Samir, what's the, the smallest company you've seen be successful? So that, um, the, the two examples that I um, mentioned, the UCF incubator company and the USF incubator company, they were both, you know, maybe they had two full-time employees. They were, they were small. So less than, um, you know, less than five employees that, especially for the phase one, um, that is, doesn't discount you by, by any means, you know, again, think about rounding out your team, maybe with some, some contractors or, or other experts, but the smallest company up to, you know, 499, um, has a shot at it. So a question from um, Dave R. How can you connect? Here I am. I am here to, um, I'd ha be happy to, to talk with you more about, you know, what opportunities are available at USF and how we, how we can get you connected. So please definitely, definitely reach out. So question from, from Lisa kind of going into some of the weeds about um, what can be the amount of work that can be kind of subcontracted. So there are limits for both um, for the uh, SBIR and STTR about how much work needs to be completed in-house versus um, out of house. And I'm just pulling up that slide here to refresh my own memory. So when you're talking about um, an SBIR, that's where it has ceilings on how much can be outsourced. So in a phase one, that's up to 33% of the work. Phase two, up to 50% um, can go to a subcontractor. So the, the majority of the work needs to be done um, by the company themselves. Um, there is some kind of distinction about you know, a subcontractor. You're going to have an agreement with that party to do um, the work. They're going to have personnel that are included in your um, application. Kind of the, the more specific question, the details around, um, you know, what can be purchased by outside um, vendors. I would encourage you to kind of dig into the individual um, solicitations or the individual agencies to get a clearer sense on, on putting the budget together. We have quite a few questions in the question and answer. Do you want me to just read a few? Yeah, that'd be great. Yes, I just had yeah. the chat open, so that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So um, one of them, I know there was a question actually that came in and this will be a two-part question. I'm gonna add two of them together. Um, first of all, does the company need to be in the US? Could they be in Puerto Rico? So the Puerto Rico is considered the US. They okay. Any Puerto Rican-based companies are eligible to, to apply um, and they actually have a... Um, a, the Puerto Rican Small Business Development Council um, provides, they receive funding from the SBA to provide um, support directly for Puerto Rican based businesses. And then kind of the second part to that is, so when, when working with companies, can a partner um, be international, but also potentially a university partner? That is a good question. I would, 
I would think no, um, but I would definitely look into that more closely. I would expect that given that it's U.S. federal funding, that all the partners would need to be, um, uh, you know, U.S. affiliated or, or based. Someone had a great question. You know, if there's a collaboration that takes place between USF and others, who owns the IP? Is it joint? How does that work? Yes. Yeah, so our, our standard um, kind of IP policy at the university, and, and this is from what I've learned, kind of typical of, of other universities as well, um, any background IP, any existing IP that a, a company owns prior to um, their collaboration, they maintain full ownership of that IP. Same goes for USF if we have any um, relevant you know, background IP. Anything that is developed jointly during the, the course of the project is going to be owned jointly. So USF would have rights to that technology and the company would also have rights to, to that technology. And that's where we bring in our um, wonderful friends over at the technology transfer office to, to talk about kind of licensing and exclusivity if that's something that the, that the company is interested in. Right, so someone else had a great question. They said, you know, how do they get in touch with program managers and contact their, and get their contact information? Right, so they are really shocking for the amount of applications that they come. They're very kind of open with their, their contact info. So right on the solicitation, um, they're gonna list their name and their personal website in, or personal email address um, in most cases. So you can reach out to them directly, but also some of the, um, the larger agencies definitely have um, you know, program specific webinars where it's the program manager that's presenting the opportunity and you can kind of ask questions back and forth just like in this setting. So we were, you know, when you're doing the application, does someone need to, you know, they need help with resources such as to prepare, prepare a budget, uh, review the application, where do people go for that kind of thing? So right now, our, our best bet is to connect you with the Small Business Development Center, which is actually um, home base right above where Shannon's background screen is, um, right in the USF Research Park. So they have um, they have um, experts in in co government contracting and in SBIR that can help you with the with the budget. Um, Hoping in, in just a few months, we'll also have some resources through through the corridor to provide some some more kind of one on one nitty gritty um, assistance in those areas. So. And, and someone Logan actually had a great question. You know, you know, I know you said to you, you suggested going on and checking and doing the search criteria and kind of putting in some keywords and everything. But how does someone go about finding out if their their idea is a good fit without actually going into all of the registration? And you know, is there I guess the question is, is there a shortcut? Probably not with federal funding, right? Uh, probably. I mean, a short answer, you know, there isn't a, uh, a zero effort shortcut. Um, you know, the shortcut is kind of, you know, doing your due diligence and really reading some of the proposals, attending those agency specific events, reaching out to, to the, the program managers um, to have those, those types of conversations. So definitely easier than going ahead and submitting a full application and then only to find out that you weren't super, you know, responsive to what they were looking for, but no, uh, no super easy shortcuts, unfortunately. So uh, Michael had a great question. We're going to combine two things together. He wanted to know what's the success rate for like the initial pitch and then are the success rates similar for the SBIR and the STTR? I know you kind of had them both at the same time there. Right. So the um, the initial pitch, if you're talking about the, the NSF um, kind of project pitch, those rates are, from my understanding, they're relatively high. They're really, you know, are you kind of generally responsive um, and then it's just an invitation to submit. Um, the kind of breaking down, I have some of the, the numbers up up here. The SBIR and STTR, um, there's not much different in the success rate. Looking at the, the most recent stats, it's 16% success for SBIRs, 19% for um, STTRs when you're talking about phase one, and then 55% for, for phase two and 47% uh, for phase to SBIRs and then 47%. So about 20% and 50% in, in both SBIR and STTR. Great. I saw one question um, specific to the, the corridor. So is there a deadline for corridor, 
grant applications? No, there is not. This is a rolling program. Um, so we can be responsive to when is the right time for the project. Um, you know, if it's if it's SBIR related, you know, when are all those um, kind of ducks in a row? Um, so nope, rolling, rolling deadline, um, rolling application. And a question, the, the two to one um, match ratio. That's a very good question. So the way that the corridor funds um, work, the budget, it's, a, it's kind of a three-part budget if you're looking at the whole project budget. There's going to be a dollar that's required from the, the company in cash. So that's actually funding money that you're paying to the university, either from your subcontract or from if you have your own internal R&D budget. And then there's going to be a dollar of company in kind. So that's where we ask the company to quantify beyond you, know, you providing dollars, what are you investing in this project? So that's going to be like your time. I'm spending time working with faculty and, um, and students on this project. I provided supplies, materials. They're, you know, the faculty are, are using some of my equipment, let's say. And the reason we ask for that um, in kind piece is to really demonstrate that these are collaborative projects, that it's not kind of a vendor um, customer, you know, relationship that um, there's kind of, you're working together throughout the project. And then the third piece is the dollar from the corridor. So if you had, let's say a $50,000 subcontract from an NSF SBIR, you, we'd ask 50,000 of company in-kind support, and then you could come to the corridor for an additional 50,000 to go right towards the research. When you're talking about the, the corridor and the match and everything, um, I, I understand a little bit about what you do here at USF, but for those on here, you know, the, their questions are, do you need to be doing an SBIR or want corridor funding to be able to connect with researchers at USF? How does that process work? I know you mentioned in here, you had that matchmaking piece, but do you only do it for those things? Or if someone's in talks with another area and they wanted or they wanted to be able to work with USF, what do they do? How do they do that? Right. I mean, reach out to, to both Shannon and I. We are here to, to make it easy for companies to connect with the university. I also work really closely with um, our colleagues over at the Office of Corporate Partnerships. So while we are focused, we're underneath research and innovation. So we're focused primarily on helping companies plug in for, for research or into the incubator or things like that. If you're more generally interested in connecting with USF, maybe for hiring or to do um, a capstone program or, or some other way, we can help you get connected with um, Morgan Holmes, who's the director of the Office of Corporate Partnerships, and she can, can help there. And we work really closely together um, to, to make it as, as seamless and kind of stress-free for companies um, as possible. We so, do, don't we? <laughs> we try. We try. We really do try. We do try. So a question from Irfan, he was interested in some of the other, um, more details on the other registrations. So Irfan, that's where those tutorials um, that I, I'm going to share a link with are going to be really helpful because they will walk you through really explicitly with, you know, these are what registrations are required for which individual um, uh, agency and give you some, some guidelines on um, how long the process takes, what you have to do, kind of all that, all that good stuff. You're welcome, Irfan. Um... So any other questions at the moment? I think what we're going to do is wrap up unless you see another one that you needed to jump on right away. No, I saw um, the note from, from Cynthia Washington about yes. the diversity works. Um, thank you for your, your info, um, Cynthia. So yeah, it, as the amount of minority women-owned, diverse-owned businesses that participate in this program is, is less than you know the Kind of percentage of the population they are they are underrepresented as frankly is the whole state of florida we are underrepresented um in this in this program so that sba catalog um, catalyst prize that i mentioned was specifically to help kind of build awareness with um with among those types of, of businesses and cynthia happy to to learn more about what you're doing and see um how we can we can expand that here to florida so I think we're going to close with this last question, and then um, we'll give you just some quick resources on what's coming your way for everyone. Uh, Miguel asked, and it's actually a great question. Yeah, he wants to know, can you, can you, if you're seeking to find funding, and can it fall into, and it falls into both categories, SBIR and STTR, can they apply to both, only one? Can they have multiple SBIR applications? How does that work? Very good question. Yes. So yes and yes. So you can apply to both programs. You can have multiple um, awards. Um, or, or applications going on um, at once that, you know, obviously the, 
the in the STTR side, you have to have that that university research partner. Um, so it tends to, you know, what I've seen is, you know, faculty, if they don't have connections with the university, they tend to kind of start with the SBIR route because that's not a, a limiting factor. If they're not able to partner, they can still go ahead. Um, but if you, I'm happy to, if there's some opportunities you want to explore, I'm happy to talk about what, where our faculty might be able to, to fit in. But yes, there's, um, that I've seen, there's no limit on, you know, it's just what your, your team has the bandwidth of, of managing both from the actual research and of course, from the, you know, the logistics and kind of bureaucracy of, of the funds. Right. And also that, that being said, you can have multiple app because the applications are constantly rolling out there. It's right. not a one yes. and done. It's yeah. not like you, it's just quick, right? Right. I mean, we have some of the companies that that I've worked at, some through the incubator and other other ways, they are constantly kind of churning out applications, repurposing one application for another opportunity. So yep, the more obviously the more irons in the fire you have. Um, and then you hope that you're in the the tough position of having, you know, so much work that you <laughs> you're stressed with all the all the awards that you received. That's right. That's right. Well, we're running out of time here. Um, and what we'll do is you can contact Elizabeth during when we send you out our survey. Not only will there be the recording here, but also uh, you can connect up through her through LinkedIn. Her LinkedIn profile will be there. She does check it. I know she does. Um, so she'll be happy to connect up with you if you'd like to reach, you know, reach out to her, whether it's about the corridor, SBIRs how to connect with the university or anything under the sun of, of that. You can do all of that. We thank you so much for being here today. Um, you know, we were thrilled and delighted to have you. And thank you, Elizabeth, for your time and your energy and efforts. We really, really appreciate it. And again, we look forward to doing more of these. Thank right, you, everyone. Terrific. Please stay safe and healthy out there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.